Greg Peterson here, and I want to thank you for listening to the Urban Farm Podcast. We wouldn't be able to keep doing these great shows without you. So as a token of my appreciation, I'd like to offer you access to a list of our top 10 episodes I personally find most inspiring. If you enjoy the Urban Farm Podcast but don't have time to listen to every one, then you will love this list. Although all our guests have great information to offer, if you are short on time, these 10 are must-listens. To get access to the top 10 most inspiring podcast episodes, text FARMER to 44222. That's FARMER to 44222. And enjoy listening. You're listening to the Urban Farm Podcast, your partner in the grow your own food revolution. Whether you've just been introduced to urban farming or you're a lifelong advocate, we're sure you'll leave feeling more informed, equipped, and empowered to dig deeper into the soil of your local food economy. With you every step of the way, here's your host, Greg Peterson. Today on the Urban Farm Podcast, we have Josh Trott to talk about his experience with a community-scale permaculture farm. Born to two service-oriented medical professionals, he spent most of his upbringing in the fields and forests of North Carolina, which at the time was transitioning from a rural agriculture economy into a service-based economy. The sprawl and destruction of the traditional culture lost in the transition process left him with an undeniable distrust of growth and consumerism. So he graduated from the University of Colorado with a degree in environmental conservation. And after college, he spent the summer as an intern for the Solar Energy International's Renewable Energy and Construction School. That sounds cool. He spent time in abroad in Spain during college and traveled through South America. In 1997, he moved full-time to what is now known as D Acres, where he specialized in forestry, construction, and farming. Currently, he is a member of the Artistic Roots Co-op in Plymouth and serves as treasurer of Pemi Baker Solid Waste District. He also participates in local government as the Dorchester Town Moderator, how cool is that, overseeing elections and facilitating the annual town meeting. The fate of humanity preoccupies his thoughts. Welcome to the show today, Josh. Yes, Greg. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. So I shared a bit about you. Can you fill in the blanks for us and share more about the path you took to get where you're at now? Oh, sure. So as far as I can remember, you know, is sort of my recollection is uh, growing up in North Carolina Mm -hmm. and really experiencing more or less the American dream. My parents got, got into medicine to be of service to, you know, fellow citizens and they ended up making a quite a bit of money. And so we lived, oh, pretty, pretty much a life of affluence uh, as North Carolina changed from a uh, tobacco-based uh-huh. economy into uh, what my father was involved with was medical services. And so the economy transitioned and we got, instead of, you know, endless fields of tobacco and sort of that culture, we got strip malls and uh, suburbia and uh, stoplights and that sort of business. And, I, you know, as, as in the midst of it, I don't really think I recognized it as, uh, you know, an evil per se. Uh-huh. But I do think that um, it became apparent to me in other shapes and forms. Uh-huh. You know, there was just like whew, an increase in flooding in the neighborhood that was associated with all the mm, pavement and just the structures that were going in. Right. And then there was, say, the loss of wildlife. I, I remember crabbing. You know, I don't know if you know what crabbing is, but we would just take chicken bones onto a string and be able to dip it into the water. And uh, a little crab would come up and you'd fish it out with a net. And, but, you know started doing that when you're you know, five, six, seven years old, and by the time you're a teenager, there's really no more crabs because mm. of the development, and, you know, just sort of the pollution and the associated uh, destruction of what? ecological habitat. Yeah, what year would that have been? Ish. So you, you figure uh, late 70s, early 80s. Yeah. 
Yeah, so we're about the same age. I'm I was born in 1961, and I had a, a, a deep sense in the mid 70s that there was something really wrong going on with our food system and in the environment. So, yeah, yeah, it, it was really pronounced, and I think it it did sort of disturb me in various ways as a kid. And you know, I'm not saying I'm doing some sort of penance or taking some sort of sacrifice for martyrdom for all the enjoyment or the pleasure that was received, you know, during that era. I think it's more of, well, maybe I'm in recovery, so to speak. <laughs> yeah, I heard that. Uh, just sort of living a cleaner life and really reaping the rewards of that. Um, I, I don't know if cleaner is an adequate adjective for that, mm-hmm. but it's a, uh, it feels better. Yeah. In lots yeah. of ways. Yeah. You know, that's really what it comes down to. How's it feel to you? Yeah, yeah, for yeah. sure. How's it feel to you? The last sentence of your bio, it so rings true to me because it's, it's, it's something that's on my mind on a daily basis. It's, you, you said the fate of humanity preoccupies your thoughts. Can you say more about that? Mm, well, I think uh, I've been so blessed in so many ways and having the, the, more or less the, the time to consider um, and to study the situation that we're facing as as a keystone species, mm-hmm. as a species that you know can really positively or negatively impact impact the ecology of, of the entire planet. We have to take responsibility for that, and uh, it's just a fact. Uh, I, I feel like a fact, an ecological fact. Uh, scientific, so to speak, fact that we mm-hmm. can't ignore and to go about as if as if we could or we, we should ignore mm-hmm. our responsibilities yeah. is just sort of preposterous and it, it's gone on f- for way too long. Yeah, I mean, we, We've been sidetracked and distracted with the, with the bread and circus, so to speak, for, for quite some time and uh, the sooner we can get back to our roots and and sort of feel the sun on our face and uh, <laughs> the dirt in our fingernails. I think the, the better we're going to be as a as long term residents on this planet. Yeah, I think it's just important uh, in terms of our shifts. I think the the recognition of a responsibility to one another and to to the ground on which we're walking is has got to be right up there. Yeah, um, the, the, that recognition and. and then that commitment to, to take on that responsibility, it's got to come from pretty deep. Yeah. Yeah, that is the case. So you, you said getting back to our roots. How do we get back to our roots? Well, you know, for me, I think a lot of it has to do with simply trying to stay put. The mobility of our society, it makes it quite possible to live and you know, go through the bucket list of places to be in life. Um, once again, I had really good fortune to, to see a lot of really spectacular places and cultures and people in, in a fairly short amount of time early in my life. Um, but at this juncture, what I feel like we have to do is just settle in and uh, the there's a <laughs> there's a, actually a quote a Bob Marley quote that, that speaks to, and it probably is biblical, as, as he often referenced, but uh-huh. it's the the uh, the sweetest fruit comes from the deepest roots. Oh, yeah. Um, I, I think it, it, it does, um, it really rings true to me to stay in one place and, and uh, develop the skills of observation for that locality. Mm-hmm and discover the connections that can be made with people in place. Um, it, it is a matter of getting that sort of sweat equity with one another and going right. through different times and different li- life patterns, you know, sharing um, the death of our elders and the birth of the, the newcomers and watching them uh, grow into positions Yeah, uh, within our community. It's, it's uh it's powerful stuff for us as humans that mm-hmm. I think we're because of our mobility 
and because of the, the sort of the anonymous nature of our society, it's uh, something we all don't uh, participate in. Participate in, or really feel the rewards of. I mean, yeah. the more rewards of that process are tremendous, and without those rewards, then. There's the loneliness, the depression, the sadness that yeah. is really uh, stricken our society. Yeah. Well, I can, I can hear you on having deep roots. I've actually lived within five miles of where I'm sitting right now for 50 years. Wow. Yeah. That's tremendous. Yeah. And I've lived in this house where I'm sitting for 28 years. Uh, which is more than half my life. That was a mind-boggling thing to me. So one of the things that Heidi and I have have kind of talked about was you know moving to someplace quieter because we live in phoenix arizona the middle of you know 4.4 million people and you know we want to go someplace quieter but the the honestly the big thing that keeps me here is the the depth of the roots that i have here yeah. you know it's it's it would be such a hard move to to leave you know, essentially bet between Heidi and I, almost a hundred years of history. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, it's tremendous, really. Well, to me, you know, it really gets at the, the crucial issues that we're facing in terms of building a really sustainable, regenerative agricultural system. Uh -huh. We need continuity mm. in our farming. Yeah. And so when you have farm switching ownership yep. or being subdivided you, you, you lose the infrastructure you lose uh, you know years of experience different ways that we can approach farming so that there's more continuity yeah so there's strategic plans that oh why can't we start thinking about farming in terms of the next 500 years mm. um how how do we get there though in terms of our social and economic systems so that, that that tenure, that continuity right. can be encouraged. You know, it's, it's a tremendous thing to hear of a farm that's in its sixth generation family farm. Oh my gosh, yes. But, but you, and I, you know, we definitely want to encourage that model, but it's so rare. Mm -hmm. It's so rare that because of the system of inheritance, yeah. because of the systems of just sort of our cultural understanding of the transitions of land mm -hmm. and the economic necessities for older farmers to cash out right. have made it sort of a very difficult thing to think about intergenerational planning on a farm scale. Yeah. And uh, I think that's really where we need to get at. I mean, if we could get there and then push beyond that and be planning as regions, to really look at our food system, you know? So, uh, well, we need to devote more space in the flatlands for our grain crops, and mm -hmm. maybe we want to put more effort into uh, orcharding on our, on our hillsides and slopes. Just, just looking at that big picture and trying to figure out how farms could cooperate with one another over yeah. a 10, 15, you know, 20, 30-year cycle. You know, just get past the whole thing of, well, the farmer gets old, and then you know the grass starts to grow high, and the, the yeah. field edges start to grow in, and then you know somebody has to come in and clean up a mess, so to speak, right. or you know they they cash out, and then it's just a bunch of houses getting popped up. Yeah, yeah. Wow. So one of the things that I look for in my podcast are epic moments, and you just spoke one that I wanna that I wanna look at. You said. Planning our farms out 500 years. What? Oh, yeah. I mean, there, there's that incredible book, the, the Farming for 40 Centuries or whatnot. Uh -huh. you know, the, I think it, if we could just envision, you know, what the next 40 centuries could look like. Yeah. You know, that's, I think that, that's the kind of foresight that we need as a society. Versus we're stuck in an annual, we're stuck in the... Um, you know, it all starts anew January 1st. Right, exactly. It, it's so illogical. It's yeah. not It's not based on any sort of reality that it makes sense or, or would be useful to us. Right. 
Yeah, exactly. Uh, so I love Wes Jackson's quote, and I'm paraphrasing here, but he speaks to if you're not thinking out a hundred years, you're not thinking big enough. And you could, you know, I love it that you went out five hundred years, even. Mm. Well, I, I think in terms of, you know, I think his research is primarily based around uh, growing the grains and yeah. perennializing the, the grain crops. I think that's definitely noble work, looking at that biology, so to speak. Oh yeah. And, you know, so continued plant propagation for, you know, genetically selecting species and so forth. And really looking at that, uh, at switching from an annual to a perennialized mm -hmm. agriculture. Yeah. But I think it falls short in some ways because it really doesn't address the uh, issues of uh, land ownership and All how right. to break apart the current system, which is so... You know, to me, it's the same as if uh, the King of England had deeded us the land. It's, you know, the deeds of, of our country are, are locked up in courthouses. <laughs> right. Where the paperwork, uh, you know, just creates, it's a, in a, it's a system of inequities based yeah. on its historical patterns where realistically, you know, at some point in time, the King of England did deed the land out in Dorchester, the town yeah. I live. Oh, wow. And it, yeah, it's gone on, you know, um, for over 200 years. Yeah. The, the white people moved in, and all of a sudden, uh, they had boundaries on the, on the property. And, you know, for whatever reason, I mean, right now, if, if I stop paying taxes, the the king of the USA is going to come in and take yeah. the land from me. Yeah, exactly. So I'm just paying rent to the government. Right. right. And in terms of where I think we really need to be addressing these issues is in the, the framework of ownership. How mm. can people occupy the land intergenerationally without having the, the papers? Yeah. How can, how can we work together and uh, create economic systems that provide for one another and provide, you know, the, the needs of life, mm -hmm. the, the, the seed to seed needs for people, you know, from our infancy to our elderly years. Yeah. How, how do we create those social structures that are enduring and progressive and evolving to, to meet our needs? Right. As, as you're saying, you know, you break up that political, you break up that economical, you break up all these service sectors, they're, they're falling apart. And oh, yeah. they're, the, the, the inequities are very apparent, and the, uh, the pollution and destruction uh, that they cause, these systems of exploitation and, you know, consumption, high energy use are um, breaking us and breaking the planet. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And now I'm, I'm assuming, I'm, so I have this beautiful book sitting here in front of me, The Community Scale Permaculture Farm. This is a, a book that you wrote and that is published by one of my favorite publishers, Chelsea Green Publishing. Um, I'm assuming that you're going to be, in your book, you talk a lot about this. Well, you know, the book, it, we really try to break, uh, in the table of contents, I think you'll see, we really try to break apart the... Uh, the systems in, in a framework that's somewhat logical, mm -hmm. you know, so you're talking about the animal systems, you're yep. talking about the uh, farm infrastructures, you know, the buildings, you're talking about the land forms, um, you're talking about the governance, economic systems, the governance, yeah. really just trying to explore all the different aspects. And what our, what our intention was, was to share our experiences. Mm -hmm. So it's definitely not... <laughs> A, a book where we're hoping to uh, solve people's problems with, you know, some sort of elixir or miracle cure. Right. It's rather uh, let people be aware is that these problems are uh, common. They're shared problems uh, that we're working to address, and uh, the system is evolving. I think yeah. we, we really tried to illustrate that in the book, that to succeed, you're, you're probably not going to follow the initial preconceived plan. You're going to have to adapt. <laughs> You're going to have to um, 
respond, be responsive in, in your in your strategies. And so I think that that sort of improvisational think on your feet to meet your goals is really the lesson learned yeah. overall well, through this process for well, us. That, that's really permaculture right there, what you just spoke. That would be a great definition for permaculture. Uh, yeah, I think I think it is. It, it's what what it will will take for us to continue to thrive on this planet is the adaptive response mechanisms yeah. to meet our goals. Oh yeah, yeah. I do want to read a quote off of the back of your book in honor of Toby Hemingway, who recently has passed away. Toby is, was a good friend of mine and author of Gaia's Garden. And he says about your book, he says, as any good permaculture project should. This book stacks functions. It's at once a chronicle of the reinvention of an old family property as a 21st century enterprise, a hand guide book for developing a successful community, and a useful how-to for ecological homesteading and farming. If you are doing any of those or thinking about it, this book should be in your hands. That's a pretty epic statement from... Somebody that I know doesn't take statements like that very lightly. So you've done some incredible work on your farm there, yes? I would emphasize that it's been a group process. Mm -hmm. um, Good community, yes? Yeah, where I have more or less been you know, a, a part of it, uh, not necessarily uh, leading the way in this endeavor. It's once again, in terms of looking at the the breadth of the work that we've done here, mm -hmm. I think you really have to look at the integration of people mm -hmm. as as a as a force. Um, this this farm project is uh, you know I had there's there's nuts and bolts to it. There's bricks and mortar, but without the creativity and the commitment and devotion to the, these sort of goals you, you're just not even uh, you're not scratching the surface yeah. of, of what's possible yeah it, it's really what it takes and it's really what you know when you look at a farm I think it, it's so often overlooked the, the farmers right and how to get more than one to work together <laughs> right. mm -hmm. We've, we, you know, this sort of the role model is the the family farm, the stoic uh, combination, man woman combination, typically, and mm -hmm. you know they just lean into it and uh, push real hard, don't complain. Um, I think that model for us to transcend has got to uh, we we've got to loosen up that a little bit. We've got to find different ways to make it multi-generational, to make it uh, a, a process that we can all participate. Yeah. And so just with those goals in mind, then it opens up tremendous opportunities. Yeah. Because the, the farm no longer has to depend on that, those, that automatron, that, that sort of that limited dimension, or one, I won't say one dimensionality, but it, it is a, a limited, limited. Yeah, I like that. It, it limits the possibilities. Yeah. So if if you can um, bring in the people power. Yeah. Then, well, and the then, community power too, right? Well, it, that, uh, <laughs> it's all cumulative and it's all integrative. So uh, what? It's sort of. In a, in a graphic sense, mm -hmm. it's those concentric cir circles or overlapping circles where we feel like, you know, there's people that are definitely living on site here that uh -huh. are coming and going. Right. And then w what you speak of, the broader community, the people that come for the pizza night or the, yeah. the once a month breakfast or, you know, just our, our, we have friends in the community who will provide either volunteer hours or financial assistance um, for, for certain programs and projects. So, yeah, it is sort of, and, you know, even, I mean, every farm has got to have your fix-it shop, your hardware oh, store. Your, yeah, exactly. Your, uh, your local pub, so to speak. <laughs> um, we rely a lot on 
the town of Plymouth uh-huh. and their the services well more or less their waste. So we go down to Plymouth and we get our the food for our pigs and we get cardboard for sheet mulching, pick up our coffee grounds to compost mm-hmm. and really whatever other residues that they, they would have us haul away. And we are, you know, we serve a function in in their mind. You know, we're sort of this uh, street urchin cleaning cleaning up the place. Right. And in our mind, we're, you know, we're we're building an Eden on the on the side of the hill. Nice. So, so how, it's, uh, how many acres is D Acres Farm? Geez, uh, the farm is about two hundred acres. Wow. But there's, you know, we we overlook the White Mountains, the National Forest, and uh-huh. that's three quarters of a million acres. And there's a, a neighbor behind us that has uh, substantial land holding as well. So it's sort of, yeah, I think once again, in terms of our thought process, mm-hmm. or specifically my thought process, I, I look at it as, as ownership of the watershed. Um, oh, right. Being re- responsible for this. This region that I call home, this region that, you know, uh, I'm within bikeable distance, you know, on any given day, the region in which, you know, I do most of my commerce, my face-to-face, mm-hmm. that's, uh, that's what I own. Uh, yeah. That's what I own up to. That's what I have to take care of, be responsible for. Yeah. The, you know, it's what, what I can really... With the roots that I have established, what I can, uh, what what I can affect. Yeah. And yeah. so that's a sort of I think, you know, in trying to take on these immense responsibilities, you know, we we were concerned about the fate of humanity and so forth. Mm-hmm. But but ultimately, we can't overextend ourselves in our daily practice. Yeah. And so it's about sort of defining the scope of, of where you want to, where you, you want your roots to, to show fruit. Yeah. How many people live on the property at any given moment? That's a, such a, um, a yeah. moving target. I'll bet. I was, I, I'm, <laughs> right I'm sitting here looking at this book and it's like, oh man, I want to come and spend some time there. It looks delightful. Yeah, no, it, it, it's definitely... <laughs> There's a lot that goes on here, and a lot, a lot of um, positive experiences and learning moments, and yeah. uh, just a, a lot of ways that you can stay active and engaged. But it, so the population tends to uh, be a lot higher in the summertime. Oh, well, not surprising. So we can go up to like between 10 and 15 in the summertime, mm-hmm. and I would say between uh, three and 10 in the winter time. Mm-hmm three and seven in the winter time nice so a lot of that is you know for what what it's worth when we began this project we we were really more or less a wolfer style farm Uh you know i was 25 years old i moved up here with my sister to my great aunt's farm Mm -hmm. she's you know elderly 89 years old and i was 25 my sister was like 22 23 and we're coming off the west coast coming off like the the San Juan Islands and traveling around, right. you know, wolfing on different farms and sort of uh, gaining those experiences. So what our initial conception of a farm was the type of farm where, oh, yeah, you could come whenever you wanted to and stay as long as you like and yeah. sort of uh, laissez-faire type arrangement where mm, people just sort of come and go at their leisure. Uh-huh. And, uh, you know, we tried to initiate an idealist perspective on our work schedule and the types of agricultural endeavors that we would pursue. And we really tried to stay true to the uh, agricultural philosophy. We we have yet to buy a rototiller. We've been really true to sort of our agricultural practices, no-till philosophy. Right. But we have ended up shifting from this idealistic uh, four hours of bread labor a day to, uh, seems like, considerably more work. 
Well, that's what it would take so, on 800 acres, I would guess, was more than that. Yeah, well, the, the, it's 200, and the, um, the, the, the work, well, we don't necessarily even farm uh, intensely much more than five acres. All right. But it is, it's the, it's the handwork and mm -hmm. just the, sort of the work required to maintain the homestead in various levels. And I, it, it, it's added up. Oh, so yeah. I think to accomplish, accomplish the breadth of the work that we have, it's been a, a consider, of those hours of the day that we are occupied with tasks, it's just immense. <laughs> I, oh yeah, no, I, I've got a third of an acre in Phoenix, Arizona, and I know what it takes to run this. So I can't even imagine, you know, uh, you know, a property is beautiful as what I'm looking at here in this map and 200 acres. Mm -hmm. So, although it look, a lot of it looks wooded and, and you're also, um, looks like you're raising pigs. Yeah. Yeah. Are you raising pig, pigs for food as well? Yeah. The pigs, well, the pigs, the primary purpose is to help us build soil. Mm, right. There's just, you know, this is not, uh, agricultural, the, the agricultural history of this land, those those colonialists, the uh, the white people that came in in the yeah. seventeen and eighteen hundreds, mm -hmm. just failed historically mm -hmm. miserably. Yeah, um, the land's really not very fertile, and so fertility is our primary concern. And so the pigs are eating the refuse from the town of Plymouth. You know, right. we bring up tons tons of food waste. And um, pigs do do the ecological disruption uh -huh. that otherwise the northern forest uh, is it's just it tends to bounce back very quickly. Right. And uh, so the pigs provide an ecological disruption and uh, enhance the fertility, and then we come in and we're doing more of our food production in those spaces. Mm -hmm. So it's a rotational plan as well as um, enhancing their fertility. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm reading under your mission. The first sentence of your mission says, the mission of D-Acres is to serve as an educational center that researches, applies, and teaches skills of sustainable living and small-scale organic farming. And it sounds like that's exactly what you do, which is beautiful. Oh, yeah. No, it's a... Uh uh, once again, in terms of this whole adjustment, mm -hmm. I think there is this discrepancy that I was led to believe that it was going to be a lot less work. <laughs> I just can't overemphasize the sort of the nature of the marathon yeah. and the the necessity to to pace yourself mm -hmm. in, in this marathon it just you know you you on a year to year basis you really have to evaluate you know your personal health self care your well being and, and get the the rest and you know the whatever you need to recuperate and revive yourself yeah to be ready when you need to sprint or you need to um you know push a solid hill right it just sort of, you know, maintaining your reserves of energy because the, the, I won't say it's a race, but the course is, is long and grueling. Yeah. And so you just got to uh, face yourself. Yeah, and take and care you, of you know, yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, go, go when you can and then rest when you can as well. Yeah. You know, interesting, earlier, a little earlier in our conversation, you called... I believe you were speaking about your life. You called it your practice. Hmm. Mm. Yeah. No. I. I think that's as well. The. <laughs> it's funny. That's what they call the the study of medicine. Yep. Practicing. Yeah. I, I've always taken that as a cue for our our life's work. Yeah. And uh, really uh, consider that it's it's really easy. To uh, put yourself down because certain experiments didn't work, or 
uh, you know, you put a lot of effort and energy into certain things, and, and they didn't come out the way you hoped. But the 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 fruit is in the practice. Yeah. The fruit is is in the the the, the going through the motions. The journey. And yeah. yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And that, that to me is a, is a lot about the the putting in the roots and so forth. You you don't you don't see the progress on that on a day to day. You you pick up on it in five and ten year increments. <laughs> Right. You know, exactly. you don't. You're not gonna. You're not gonna see that sort of immediate gratification that we're used to with yeah. these kind of practices. But you, you do see the rewards, or the, you know, the. You see the uh, your capacity to attain your goals uh, requires that time. Yeah. Yeah. So you, you mentioned it a moment ago, failure. So this is, I'm going to take this opportunity to transition. And I'd like for you to talk about a time you failed, how you overcame that failure, and what you might have learned from it. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, I, I think in various ways, it's the, the people aspect that worries me the most. And I, I will hold it to myself. And to a degree, because I'm, I am at times I feel like I'm the last person standing. <laughs> uh huh. And it's the sort of the system at which I, I have the most resentment as well. You know the the patriarchy is to me, you know, the, one of the real defining points of our failure as a society, and to be uh, sort of in that position where. You know, it's my parents' property at this juncture, and you know they stuck a bunch of money into this thing, and uh, sort of live, living with that uh, authority and that responsibility, uh-huh. and trying trying to transition it into a place that is it shifts the, these definitions of ownership and shifting the uh, the responsibility away from. Uh, individuals trying trying to to make that shift and you know being uh it, it, in a, in a way feeling almost the catch 22 of that situation yeah Try, trying to work to work to, work to defy uh these preconceptions and so forth and so it's it's a constant <laughs> challenge yeah. and uh trying trying to um Trying to see uh, other people's perspective on a, on a regular basis. Trying to open, you know, open myself up to the vision that we really need is is not my own. Yeah. So you know that's is, is constant work in that regard. Yeah, that is the case. So, what do you consider your biggest success? Oh, uh, just getting up and trying it again every day I think the determination Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's uh, you know as the the answer you perhaps are looking for but that's what makes me feel good is just being able to do it again do it again Um, I (laughs) if we made it through the day and we can do it again tomorrow Tomorrow. I think it's a success yeah that's beautiful Uh, and I'm gonna keep trying to shoot for that for as long as I can. Yeah. As uh, you know, I mean, life's so darn temporal anyway. You just gotta put it right. to it when, when you can, and yeah, hope for the best. Live live in the moment. That's for sure. You know, and that goes back to what you said earlier about the journey. This is it's about the journey, and you know, we we all have this idea that when I get that car or get that house or you know, have so much money in the bank, I'm going to be happy. And we forget to be happy along the way. Oh, yeah. You know. You got to soak this stuff up. Yeah. Yeah. So um, what drives you? I really like the plants and the animals. I mean, I like, that's one of the things that I think about when I wake up in the morning is like greeting them mm-hmm. and being a part of that. And, you know, on a, on a personal level, I really like fresh air and water. <laughs> yeah. I really like the like swimming holes around here and like 
tree climbing, uh-huh. like being able to go out and be in the woods. So I think, you know, I, I, uh, on a personal level, you know, I've had this luxury, this this capacity to roam this planet and, you know, drink, drink, drink uh, just really soak it up. Right. Drink it up. And uh, I would like everyone else to have that opportunity as well. So I, I have a lot of motivation to provide that. Yeah. yeah. So wherever I... Uh, <laughs> I, I don't have to look hard for uh, motivation. There's so much to uh, <laughs> yeah. to do and to give. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah. So I'm all about education, and I have to know, is there a book or two that has been influential for you in this process in your life? Well, definitely the Nearings, the Helen and Scott Nearing, the Good Life People. Oh, yes. And, you know, I think, uh, you know, just really studying up on their legacy and really accepting when you get into the nitty gritty of this stuff that the many failures of character, so to speak. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. uh, I'm, I, I don't want to badmouth anyone, but we've all got faults. We've all got, like, for the wonderful things that we do and, and say, there's many reasons why we why we got to, to that point. And I don't... I'm not looking for any uh, any angels or any gurus on mm-hmm. this planet, so to speak, that 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 are like ivory white. I think mm-hmm. the gurus and stuff have dirt under their fingernails from from earning it. Yeah, yeah. How true is so, that? How true is that? The uh, the Nearings book too. The as far as like exploring the other. Uh, works that they produce beyond the the the, to, the the good life and the sort of the token popular books, but get more into the um, the writings they did, the social science handbooks, and just the the deeper study of of their work. I think is so um, relevant today. Yeah. When we talk about contemporary social dysfunction, yeah. corporatization. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, but the nearings are big, and then who else could we point to in terms of? I, I think Derek Jensen was really influential for me for a long period of time. Who was that? Uh, Derek Jensen. Oh yes. Mm-hmm. He wrote like language older than words and Endgame, just uh, sort of reconciling all the anger I had associated with society. In, in terms of the past 500 years of <laughs> exploitation, just like really being able to spell it out yeah. and to really address it and to really put it in black and white instead of trying to sweep it under the carpet or make it, you know, make it into some sort of story that it ain't. Yeah. You know, if. Uh, by ignoring our history, I think we're just so prone to repeat it or not grow from it. Yeah, yeah, so true, so true. So what one final piece of advice do you have for our listeners? Mm. Uh, just try, I guess. I mean, I'm not, that's the only way to get anything done. Don't, don't be afraid to do. Yeah. I, I'm really into this theory that you don't, we don't need academic education to become the people that we want to be. Yeah. I think that that comes from our hearts and from you know our sort of our innate humanity. Mm-hmm. And so I just think that if we get um, too, too concerned with the the science and academia of of humanity or, you know, all these systems and so forth, I think we lose the soul of it. Yeah. I think if if we could get back into just addressing ourselves as uh, life forms and just sort of enjoying that sparkle <laughs> and taking that responsibility for that sparkle yeah. and really soaking that up and and becoming conscientious in our actions, 
we could go a long way. Beautiful. Enjoying the sparkle. Gotta love that. Well, thank you so much for joining us on the show and sharing your experience with us today, Josh. It has been a treat getting to chat with you. All right, yeah. And if, if, if anybody wants any more, like, details or the how-to or, you know, what I think about uh, nonprofit structures uh -huh. or, oh, we could talk for hours, Greg. Um, oh, feel yes. free to contact me at www.dacres.org. Shoot. Call me up. Look me up in the book. All right. I'll cool. pick up the phone. All right. Beautiful. So the book is The Community Scale Permaculture Farm, The D Acres Model for Creating, Managing, and Ecologically Designed Educational Center. Josh, uh, once again, it's been great. You know, check out this book. It's an epic, epic book. You can also find show notes from today's podcast at urbanfarm.org backslash D Acres. Well, that's it for today. Thanks for joining us on the Urban Farm Podcast. Greg Peterson here, and I want to thank you for listening to the Urban Farm Podcast. We wouldn't be able to keep doing these great shows without you. So as a token of my appreciation, I'd like to offer you access to a list of our top 10 episodes I personally find most inspiring. If you enjoy the Urban Farm Podcast, but don't have time to listen to everyone, then you will love this list. Although all our guests have great information to offer, if you are short on time, these 10 are must-listens. To get access to the top 10 most inspiring podcast episodes, text FARMER to 44222. That's FARMER to 44222. And enjoy listening. We hope you enjoyed today's episode of the Urban Farm Podcast. Remember to listen three days a week for tips, advice, and resources to help you on your journey with urban farming. You can find us on the web at urbanfarm.org or send us an email to podcast at urbanfarm.org. In the words of Vincent Van Gogh, great things are done by a series of small things brought together. Be encouraged that with each lesson learned and skill developed, you are one step closer in the direction of your dreams.